Birmingham, in the age of the face mask, Centenary Square, five years after we were last here. The water jets in the fountain are pluming and sputtering. The hammering and ta 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 of construction noise behind me makes me feel a bit Mary Mungo and Mitch, especially when coupled with the spectral shadow of the cranes above. Not an unpleasant sensation, especially when for most of lockdown you've been feeling like Henry Fonda in On Golden Pond. So if Centenary Square is the side of the swimming baths, then this bit's like those little steps that go down into the pool. We're about to dive off, off the beaten track. Fancy a walk, Harris, jewellery quarter? Yeah. Not with you, though. You what? Nothing. traverses a cityscape that you're seeing things from a different angle from a different standpoint I mean a city anyway is an accumulation of standpoints vistas and viewpoints all intertwined camouflaging combining confusing the vista like creepers surrounding an old tree the city is too big to be uniform anyway it's a huge heterogeneous entity masquerading as a unified whole, a little bit like a cathedral that grows over time. It reminds me of Douglas Trumbull's science fiction work in the mid-70s where things like the Valley Forge in Silent Running were constructed from airfix kits, um, repainted, reconfigured as something else and they'd become great star liners. They always had the feeling of exposed workings as well. Um, like uh, cityscapes have for me. A little bit like the Pompidou Centre in Paris. There's proposed redevelopment here, as elsewhere. I hope they keep the flapper though. I think these great swathes of cutaway that canalscapes often afford make us realise how important it is to keep parts of the past to accrue layer upon layer rather than sweeping clean all the time because those fragments lie in wait for the visitor and the resident alike and take on different significances as you get older like fragments of overheard parental conversation as you approach the age they were when you heard them say it Suspicious fop wonders Birmingham canals talking incomprehensibly. Hmm. I'll keep an eye out for him. And tonight we've got sessions from Flapper Demolition Squad and the Suspicious Fops. Very fine they are too. new library, like Magritte's apple, dominating the vista, announcing its presence there between the two tower blocks, like a massive French fancy. 
unimaginable only a few years before. Makes you wonder what's going to be creeping up behind your house in years to come. I love the visual complexity of places like this. I always imagine what they'd be like to draw all the intersections and vertices and conflicting vistas. They're anything but fulcrums of visual excitement. They're conduits, channels between, and their nature resides therein. And if you focus on any individual part of, of, of the cityscape you're looking at, the cross-section you're looking at, say the telecom tower behind me, you're aware in your peripheral vision of objects from other planes of meaning, other dimensions, visual dimensions. It's a little bit like when you are watching something on YouTube but it's still in small screen. Say you're watching um, you know, the Sugar Cube's birthday in its original Icelandic of course, the better version. And uh, the thumbnails for suggestions are still around it. So you've got the Cocteau Twins, Musette and Drums. But you've also got Do This to Remove Earwax. <laughs> I remember when I was about 19, I had a dream that I could see the whole of my life stretched out in front of me in a sort of cityscape. And as I was 19, there can't have been too much of my life and there can't have been too many buildings in that particular cityscape. But I was moved by the experience nonetheless and decided to write a short story. Being a young man, or being the kind of young man I was, I didn't get very far with the story. I probably felt the pressing need to read uh, some John Paul Sartre or other French existentialism or perhaps to mope furiously to is this the life by the cardiacs but being here puts me in mind of it because it's like all of the parts of my life are being visually represented like they're little cameos from um, perhaps the tower blocks in the distance like the one I lived in in Colligate, Tannhaus and the flight of locks with its obvious black country associations and also a bit like um, the Kennet and Avon Canal where we filmed a few years ago. Like there are cameos from Stars of Cummings World, ghosts from the previous fabric of my existence. legging along that roof in a canal barge made for giants. It's like a huge subterranean train station roof composed of brick. We're in the environs of the jewellery quarter and the gun quarter now, above and around us, onward and upwards. So that development there, yeah, 
is called Snow Hill Wharf. Okay. And down the Grand Union Canal is a Soho Wharf. Yeah. Proposed. That's on top of the Port Loop development, McNeiled Port Loop development. Yeah. Canal neighbourhood, which we should go and film actually. Yeah. And then down in Digbeth there is a proposed development at Typhoon Wharf. Oh, why was it? Why is it the Typhoon Wharf? Uh, it was, I believe, the Typhoo Factory. Wow, what lovely words, Typhoo, the Typhoo Tea Company. Mm. The tongue taking a trip down the palate towards the teeth, as Vladimir Nabokov almost said. City is changing before our eyes, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And has been. Well, it always has, hasn't it, Birmingham? Yeah. yeah. But you can, you can ever changing. Yeah. You can see and sense it here very palpably, can't you? Mm -hmm. The Barker Bridge is very beautiful, picked out in green and cream. It's not named after Mike Barker, who often contributes to our videos, nor is it named after those beautiful Barker shoes that I bought in a jumble sale in Streatham back in 1996, but let's be honest, it would be strange if it was, wouldn't it? It is in fact named after the Barker Ironworks in Tipton from whence it springs. Perhaps the very mention of Tipton will guarantee us thousands of views, what do you think? Yeah, it's worth, well, it's worth a try, isn't it, yeah. based on uh, the fact that our Tipton film is comfortably the most successful thing we ever made. Amazing. Please don't watch Tipton, folks. Go and watch something else. Watch one of our other ones, please. I'm guessing, seeing as, um, you know, you mentioned the colour of the bridge, that you've wore the, that exact shade of green uh, jacket and that exact shade of cream trousers. Uh, is you know you're running with the theme of wearable buildings like when we were back in Sheffield. You should see my underpants. Actually, you shouldn't. And emerging from the waterways and up onto the street, you get accosted by that great corner straddling toppling bundle of architectural excitement on Hampton Street. Talk about if the Surrealists were from the Black Country. It's as though New York's Flatiron Building has been reimagined by Augustus Welby Northmore Bugin and Mervyn Peak. I'd be unsurprised to see it take off. I'm now beginning to imagine it settling and landing on the street outside my house in Stafford in the middle of the night. And speaking of AWN Pugin, here's his St Chad's Cathedral on the edge of the city centre. Funds by John Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury again. Just like Cheadle, St Giles. It's a lovely thing. Like a great German hall church, almost twice as high as it is wide. Huge columns with helical patterns and lots of other lovely detail. Surrounded by the time lapse of development though, who knows how long those little spiky spirelets will pierce the skyline before they're smothered by the glass and the steel. So just walk along Water Street or down Ludgate Hill and you emerge from the burgeoning cityscape into what is essentially a conglomerate of all small village market towns. St Paul's there atop the, uh, the square that dominates the jewellery quarter. Lovely stuff. It reminds me of what I was saying earlier about that dream that featured cameos from all the places that have been important in my life. It's as though St Paul's is masquerading as all of the churches and this is masquerading as all of the uh, small, quiet, enfolded places. been able to get into St Paul's we could have luxuriated in the east window and the box pews and the coving picked out in pale orange and green and 
scene where Matthew Bolton and James Watt had their own pews. Members of the Lunar Society, of course. And this part of Birmingham is no stranger to luminaries. Behind us is the current home of the Royal um, Birmingham Society of Artists and the gallery, St Paul's Gallery in the uh, Jewellery Quarter, I think is the largest commercial gallery outside London. And uh, in its time, the uh, society has been presided over by Frank Brangwyn, John Everett Millay, Frederick Lord Layton, Lawrence Alma Tadema, and um, Charles Bloy as well, who was responsible for loads of buildings in the West Midlands, loads of buildings I've rubbed shoulders with including the council houses in Priory Road and of course the, uh, the currently missing golden sculpture in Centenary Square of uh, Bolton, Watt and Murdoch um, spinning us right back to the beginning of our journey today. It's not the only sculpture that's currently missing there um, onwards um, or forwards or whatever it was called, that uh, rather bulbous thing that appeared in 1988 I noticed wasn't, uh, wasn't there either today. I wonder where they are and when they will reappear. great swooshing seashell wave of noise in the trees always reminds me of Blow Up, you know, the Antonioni film. The facade of St Paul's, and particularly the locked door of the church, reminds me of a Gary Larson cartoon I saw once. Um, it's um, the back of a cat with its paws spread out on a window and in front of it, through the window, is a, a, a two-truck crash. One of the trucks says, Bob's rodents on, and the other one says, Owl's small flightless birds. And you can sense the desperation and thwarted desire of the cat, even though you can't see its face, you can only see its back. And I always feel like that cat when I encounter a locked church, or, for that matter, a shut charity shop. Um, and it's, it's made me realise that I haven't been in a church for a long time. It's a beauty St Paul's. Uh, but I understand why it's locked. And I understand, of course, why I haven't been in one for a long time. Because it's been locked down. This is our first piece of filming um, since Covid struck. And one of the things I mourn about all of that is the, the passing of the seasons outside the window. The fact that I, I felt disengaged from them. Because you might think with a, a surname and initial like mine, that I would have been tempted to go and film in Barnard Castle, uh, but I wasn't. I did what I should have done and stayed behind closed doors and watched the seasons throng the window as they went past. So I feel like I, I need to say a few words for them, those seasons that never were in my life. So we started in March, didn't we? That period of great, strange gusts of wind, strange stirring tea times, murmurations of starlings, swooping in the sky, coming in like a, a lion and leaving like a lamb, as they say, turning into April, mixing dead roots with desire, as T.S. Eliot said, the daffodils, the primroses, and then the magnolia going out like dead lanterns on the lawn, and that furze of insistent green everywhere that holds back so long that you, you forget it's actually holding back, and then suddenly it explodes in that bright, virulent green and the earth reaches its point of maximum axial tilt and suddenly it is May and June and midsummer and the, the shadows stand behind the uh, sundial and the sunlight gutters and flickers in a light summer rain on the lawn and the sky thickens and becomes creamier cornflower blue and there you are, midsummer has arrived and you want to sit and read short stories under canvas in a tent in a field in some long forgotten French holiday.